that. Let's see. Let me click. Okay. So here we are. Uh, this Welcome, welcome to the Polk County RIA. In beautiful, we're coming to you from beautiful Lakeland, Florida. I am Liz, PC RIA's host for the evening, along with Adrian Smoot, our co-host. We've been doing a little bit of RIA business, and we're ready to get going with this evening's guest speaker. So thank you so much for choosing uh, to spend your time with us tonight. We're grateful, and we know you're going to benefit from some super information. Let's get the meeting started. Uh, Adrian, can you show us the disclaimer? That's one thing that really, really makes our attorney happy, just makes him glow all over. So we want to make sure we share it with you. And if you would, uh, Adrian, let people know, basically, I know they're going to read every word of it, but just give them a gist of what this means to you, our disclaimer, if you would, please. The shortest way I can say is trust but verify. So everything that is being said is for education. You still have to seek out your own legal counsel, tax, finance, whoever you believe is a professional. So trust, but verify. Yes. All right. In other words, it's not Adrian's or my fault, whatever is going on or happening or you hear about tonight. Okay. Blame someone else. Do Unless it's diligence. good, then you can blame me. If it's really good. You make a lot of money. <laughs> yes. So listen, what a great evening we're going to have. Um, it's all about finding cash for your deal. And one of the greatest ways that many of us use to buy our properties is through private lenders. Our guest speaker tonight is in the uniquely perfect position, I think, to talk about how to find the private lenders, what to say to them when we do find them. That's, you know, what do we say? What private lenders are needing from us and how they invest their funds. Uh, what kind of plans are allowed to do our type of investing and in general, just how to make it work for both sides of the lending and borrowing coin, because Larissa Green is our speaker, and she's uh, part of Advanta IRA, and Advanta is very well known for many reasons, but one of them is how they support local RIAs all in the area, and they're one of our corporate sponsors and have been for years now. So many of us here at PC RIA have our retirement funds and plans with Advanta. And um, Larissa is here to give us some great information on what we need to know on connecting with folks that want to lend out of these types of plans uh, to folks like us needing those funds. In fact, I have to tell you, um, Larissa, you weren't here earlier, but one in the group right here tonight, Andrew Boccia, he's on here and he's a customer of yours. He's our PC RIA corporate sponsor also. He does some lending, but he was just telling us earlier that he's doing his own personal retirement money is tied up with you guys, and he's getting ready to loan out of that account for some land. So we were talking about you <laughs> even earlier. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I know. So welcome, 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 Larissa. We're glad to have you here tonight. Finding money is what, what we want to know. How do we find it, Larissa? Okay, so we're going to talk about that, guys. Um, can I share my screen, Liz? Oh, yeah, I was going to say, uh, that and also, do you like the questions now or do you want them after after your presentation or how do you like I've, it, Larissa? Everybody can ask questions. I love the engagement. It's better than me just going on and on. <laughs> Absolutely. And also, guys, um, do I need to put you as a co-host or something maybe? Okay, I, I did so that you can share, I guess, now. Um, okay. While she's getting that set up, I just want to say to those of you who have questions, so here's the deal. Adrian and I are very, very uh, strong on everybody being able to ask any question they want anytime. And if you're like we were when we first started, uh, we were a little shy about asking questions, believe it or not. I always thought, man, everybody probably knows the answer but me, and I'm embarrassed if I ask this question and, you know, everybody else knows the answer. So now that I've had that experience, what Adrian and I do is we encourage you, if you want to ask something, but you don't want to do it out in front of everybody, just put the question over in the, well, not in the chat, but go over to the chat and you can send that question directly to me or Adrian, and we will ask, and no one will know it was you, or you can put your question over in chat, people will know it's from you, and Adrian and I uh, will be watching that, Larissa, so you don't have to watch, watch it or worry about it, and we'll make sure those questions get asked. Okay, before the evening is over. So Great. with all that said, glad to have you, Larissa. Really happy. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, guys, for having me and such a warm welcome. I really appreciate it. Um, I've been with Advanta 11 years, so I can remember, you know, being a part of PC RIA for years and years now and a lot of the local groups. Um, I'm going to do my own Advanta disclaimer, but my own personal mommy disclaimer is that my kids are home with me. My, my two younger ones are home with me. My son and husband went off to baseball. And um, so I apologize if you hear a little background noise for my youngest because she's sitting right next to me here listening to music. So she's one. <laughs> so you might hear her in the background a little bit, hopefully not too loud. Um, so yeah, we have been around for almost 20 years, you guys. So if you're not familiar with self-directed IRAs or more specifically, you're not familiar with Advanta, we have things going on all the time. There are always no cost, no obligation. I know you guys have your own disclaimer, but really what we do is education only. And so I'll have a disclaimer for you guys too. But our marketing is really through education. And I've been a part of that side or that part of the team for many years now, 11 years in Advanta, probably about nine years in education, marketing and business development. But our structure for marketing has always been education from the time that I started. Um, I can recall us doing webinars uh, way back when, um, and sometimes we'd only have one person log in online. So that just goes to show you, we've, we've grown as a company um, for, you know, basically from me being the 10th or 11th person hired to what we are now where we have 2 billion in assets under management. And um, we are probably at least 30 employees strong. And we're um, of course nation and even worldwide if you have a US-based retirement account. So that gives you a little bit about Advanta and a little bit about me. My contact information is there. I also did a webinar on private lending today. So like I said, our education um, is really extensive and we save everything. And so I'm gonna kind of give you some information here, but if you guys have more questions or more specific questions, maybe for example, on um, plans for the self-employed and how those contributions work and what that looks like, we have webinars on those and we're also happy to answer your questions. So I already talked about Advanta, here's a slide on Advanta. And also if you guys want the slides so you can refer back to them later, just let me know. I can also just send them to Liz and she can have them for you. If you need them, you can reach out to her. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, but like I said, we're in business almost 20 years. We're gonna reach our 20 years in I think it's February of 2023. So we're just around the corner and we'll hopefully be celebrating in a big way. Um, but we are self-directed retirement administrators, meaning that we hold the account and you find the investment. And that's very important to us is that you understand that it's, the investment is up to you. And so um, something that we don't do, tax, legal, or investment advice, we don't provide you with any of that, but we do talk about the rules and we give you guidance. And like today, we're gonna talk about different strategies that we have seen with self-directed retirement accounts. So what is a self-directed account? Very simply, it's an account that provides the owner with the ability to choose investments and very specifically outside of the market. So just keeping in mind that we don't sell any investments at all. We hold the account, you find the investment, we help you get it done in the name of the retirement account. And so when you're raising capital, that is a great way to look at it. Use it as a tool in your tool belt. And we're gonna talk about how that works for self-directed retirement accounts and how even if you're not ready to self-direct yourself, knowing about these accounts can really help you in raising capital, doing more deals, working with more investors. Um, so really, truly less than 4% um, of all retirement accounts are self-directed. And why is that? I really think it's just simply because people don't know about self-directed accounts. And that is really how you can capitalize as an investor looking to raise more capital. Because when you're talking to people and you say, well, did you know you could use your IRA to make this investment? Most people don't know that. They're very surprised to find out. So this is a new source of capital for people. They're saying, wait, there's this you know, place where I have my money and I can access that. So they have no idea that this is allowed. A lot of times I will meet people that'll say, I didn't know I could self direct. And unfortunately, I took a distribution of my account. I can't even tell you how many times that has happened where I talk to people and I, they say, I wish I had met you six months ago. I took a distribution from my 401k or my IRA. And I think a lot of us know what the cost of that is, right? It's a 10% penalty if you're under age 59 and a half. So it's 10% right off the top. And then you pay taxes on that um, in the form of ordinary income or 1099 income to you in the amount you distribute the year you distribute it. So very important to know. Another reason we pe see people self-direct is just stock market fatigue. And I think we're all seeing that right now. A lot of people are saying, you know, I'm just tired of the roller coaster. I'm tired of not knowing what's happening. 
I'd rather invest in something that I can touch, see, feel, drive by, make an investment where I know the return. So private lending, for example. And then of course the tax benefits, having earnings grow tax deferred or tax free, depending on the type of account that you hold. So, and again, these are all great ways to talk to somebody about a self-directed IRA when you're raising capital. So if you have a private money lender, and we'll talk about this more in just a few minutes, but if you have a private money lender that you work with all the time, and they say, you know what, I'd love to make this investment with you, but I just can't right now, all my money is out, it's all deployed. Well, you might say, do you have an IRA? Did you know you could self-direct it? Are you looking for another place to pull money from to make this investment? Are you tired of the stock market? You get tax benefits for making this investment. And that might be something that appeals to them um, and something they wanna learn more about. Um, so we talked about why you know, many people don't know about self-directed IRAs and you know, Alex and I are just two people. We're doing our best to get the word out there, but you know, it, it's something that isn't widely advertised. So, you know, when you hear about an account that's based in the stock market, and then you talk to somebody about real estate and IRA, the um, normal response is, how long has this been allowed? When did they start allowing this? And does anybody know? Does anybody know when this has uh, started being allowed? No? 1974, when IRAs were created, it's always been allowed. The IRS has never restricted real estate investments aside from the people that you can transact with and just the two asset classes that are not allowed. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So it's always been allowed, something that you have always been able to do. And I can't impress upon people that enough because they say, what, are you sure? <laughs> I'm sure, I promise that's the case. So why retirement funds are a great source of capital. So when you're raising capital, why does it make sense that people can make this investment through a retirement account. I think, and you know, I don't think I have this up here specifically, but for me, when I talk to people raising capital, the first thing that comes to mind is that IRAs typically tend to be the most liquid asset we have. Now I'm kind of excluding um, 401ks when you're currently participating and you have like a W-2 like I do and you're currently participating, unless you work for a great company like Advana IRA that lets you self-direct your 401k, you're typically going to be tied to the market and investments that the fiduciary of that account directs. But with an IRA, those tend to be pretty liquid. I mean, think about your IRA account and how you can simply reach out to the broker, sell the assets in that account typically. Every once in a while, we hear about you know something that has a contract, but typically you have stocks and bonds in there, right? And you can sell those investments or just wait till they time out. And now you're ready to make a new investment. So I think that that's probably why it's such a great source for raising capital. Um, but we have some other reasons here. Repeat investor. So many of you guys have a private money lender that they, they invest with you over and over again. You have a relationship um, that you consider them your um, financial friends, right? And so when you deal with them on a regular basis, you guys know each other, you trust each other. And so they repeatedly invest with you. They know what it's return to expect. But again, if they're completely deployed and they want to make the next investment, talking about a self-directed IRA might be a way that they can invest with you again. And you know, once that happens, now they've opened that door and they can invest um, with their IRA many times. Hey, over. Larissa? Yeah. Hey, Liz, I think uh, before you go on, can you explain what self-direct means? Because Ryan brought that up and I think that's a great question for those that may not know. Yep. So Self yes, it is a good it is a good question. Self-direction does not refer to the account. I think I get that question on a daily basis. Um, you know, somebody might be filling out an application and say, well, which of these accounts do I choose? I want it to be self-directed. Um, Advanta only holds self-directed accounts. The type of account is still going to be based on its tax status. So traditional IRA, Roth IRA, SEP, simple. But self-direction refers to the investment itself. So what type of investment are you making? A self-directed investment is simply a private investment. So anything outside of the market. And so that could be buying real estate. It could be lending money. It could be investing in gold and silver bars and coins. And so the list goes on and on. And I think I do have an example list in here. So we'll talk about that very briefly. But self-direction really is just defining the type of asset that you're going to hold in this account. It's self-directed. And so when you think about that, that phrase means a couple of things. It means you're going to choose the investment. 
you're going to determine everything around that investment that makes sense for you. And you're going to go out and find that investment. So it, it truly is self-directed. It's not offered on the stock market. Now, something we do hold is private stock. But again, our clients are bringing those investments to us and telling us, hey, I want to make this investment. Does that make sense? So, so Larissa, I noticed that Catherine, Catherine, you want to speak up because I thought it was great when you said on here, you have yours with Fidelity and it's not set up to be the self-directed IRA. Is that what you said, Catherine? I think. Uh, yes, um, it is not set up as a, a self-directed IRA because I have um, consulted my, uh, you know, my my person that handles it. So how do I um, get a self-directed IRA so that I can, you know, invest? Right, right. That's a great question. Um, brokerage firms are not going to hold private investments. Every once in a while, we'll hear that they were holding a limited partnership or something like that, something a little more... Um, you know, based on paperwork, almost like private stock. Um, so that we'll sometimes hear that they hold those, but as soon as they can, they start kicking those out. And then those brokerage firms are calling us and saying, hey, we have clients we need you to take. We don't want these private investments. And so although brokerage firms are, are great companies for people to work with, they don't hold anything that's considered private typically. Um, mm -hmm. They made it a business decision where they have said, hey, you know what, we're not going to hold this. It's, we consider it hard to value. We're, we don't want to be responsible for paying expenses, for example, on behalf of an IRA. We don't want to structure income as interest income. That's just not what we do. And so we're not competing with them. We are literally filling the gap in the industry for private investments. And so if you have a Fidelity account or Morgan Stanley, they might call it self-directed because they're saying, hey, you can choose from this list of investments. But if you want to hold a private investment, you would move it over to a firm like Advanta that holds self-directed IRAs. So that's something more specific. And it's not an all or nothing strategy. You can move over just you, what you want for the investment itself. So in other words, someone can keep their money like in Fidelity or somewhere to do the certain types of that they're investing. But if they want to do some self-directed, they can move part of that over to you, Larissa, at Advanta? Okay. Yes. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. And you can transfer between IRA accounts as often and whenever you like. And so if you have a deal coming up and you're going to lend money and then, you know, the money comes back, you get paid back on that loan and you don't have another deal going on, you can transfer it back to Fidelity or whoever your brokerage firm is until the next deal comes along. So you can move between those accounts as often and whenever you like. That's just a, a trustee to trustee transfer and it's not taxable and it's not reportable to the IRS. So is, is this considered a transfer into Advanta? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yep. Yep. If, if you're moving from an old employer plan, that's called a rollover. Right. But, you know, exactly. those, that, those definitions are really just like for tax purposes. But yes, you're just transferring. Typically it's IRA to IRA, which would be a trustee to trustee transfer. Ah, oh, okay. Um, and I'm still with you guys. I just am... Dealing with you the baby for a second. Sorry, guys. I'll, th <laughs> I'll throw something else that kind of goes with this topic there. One of my private money lenders, he has a lot of his money in the stock market and likes it there. And he's actually making more there than he's lending it to me, but he wants diversification. So he's using lending money as diversification within his stock market. So it's like Larissa said it. He's not putting all of it over but he wants the diversification. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty typical. We, we normally see people move over just what they want to move for a specific deal. And then they do that investment and then they might find another self-directed investment. Or let's say they decide to lend money for a five-year term. And then another note comes up where they can lend money and they say, you know what, I'm going to do that. So they move a little more money over. And then when both of those get paid back, they might go back to their brokerage firm. And, you know, self-direction, it makes it really easy. It, it's truly, you tell us what you're trying to do. We tell you how to get it done. And then we do the record keeping for it. And, you know, that brings up, uh, Becky, you had a question regarding that. If you wanted to move something over, you want to ask Larissa before we move on, because it really fits right now in this moment. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, I'm just looking for a list of the documents we need to gather to be able to move the various HSA or whatever over. I know I have, I have, um, some from companies I've left that are easy to roll over and then 
I think you can't move things until you leave a company, right? Other than that, retirement funds, et cetera. That, that would be pretty days. typical. Um, mm -hmm. You can always ask though, because I'm finding more and more that plans are allowing people to move at least some of the money, um, but they do have to have um, what they call a triggering event that would allow you to move some of that money. So sometimes it's based on how long you've been with the company or if the company is sold and then re, you know bought and you're kind of like in limbo for a, a day or whatever, they would consider that a triggering event um, when you reach a certain age or you've um, contributed for a certain amount of time. So it just depends. I am seeing um, more and more often that there, people are allowed to move at least a portion of it. So I say, you know, you could always ask, just don't be surprised if the answer is no. And then what documents, is is there a set list of documents we need to get together with you guys or? No, just a statement for the accounts. That's really it. Um, and we don't necessarily require those, but if you have a statement, we can better assist you in which forms to complete. Cause we're just gonna send you a packet of forms through DocuSign, you complete those. And then depending on where the money is coming from, we're either going to initiate a transfer. So if it's IRA to IRA, we're gonna initiate it for you based on you, you filling out our forms. Or if it's an old employer plan, you're actually gonna reach out to them and initiate the rollover yourself with your new advance account number and how to make the check payable, which is information we provide you. Okay, so I was trying to do something similar with another company and for some reason it didn't go through like they couldn't, I don't know, justify it or um, I think it had to do with my identity or something, I don't know. Do, have you had any hiccups with anybody rolling over, like any issues with things that might hold you back from, from completing um, the transaction? Well, based on, you know, just, just what you said makes me think of like our Patriot Act requirements where we do have to verify everyone who is opening an account, um, but I've never really had an issue with that. So okay. um, I think, I think maybe um, we would ask, so what we do occasionally is ask for additional documentation. So we might say, um, you know what, new accounts asked us for a W-9, for example, um, but usually we just were able to just get the additional documentation and open the account pretty standard for opening account, just your driver's license. And if you don't have a driver's license, a state ID card, um, you can also use your passport. So we try to make it really easy for you. And then once we get a, like, say you are our account or whoever our account person, we stay with that one person, or is it kind of like customer service we end up with, or how does that work? No, you do get an account manager, but it wouldn't be me or Alex um, because we're in business development. What we do is help you establish the account and get it funded. And then we do pass you off to an account manager, but then that person is with you for the life of the account. So you get your their phone number and extension, you get their direct email address, and they're with you for everything. So they're making transactions with you. You're, they're helping you make contributions to the account or take distributions, whatever it, it means to you for making that investment and maintaining that account. Yeah, and that's a that's a big piece because yeah. I know even with health, you don't have to explain your story every time. <laughs> it makes it yes. you build up that relationship. Yeah. I even find that with health insurance, man. If I have to tell my story one more time, but yeah, yeah it makes it that much easier than people know who you are. Yeah, Adrian's it's, shaking it's, his head. I was gonna say, especially everyone knows Adrian we wears speedos. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all the creative stuff that we learn. Neon speedos. Yeah, the, the, your account manager is like you can just say. Well, it's going to be just like last time. You don't have to go through and explain it all again. That's yeah. this weird deal that we learned from Pete one day, and then it has to be explained to everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Sounds yep. good. Thank you so much. Also, just to put one more plug in there, I guess, we, I didn't, we didn't mean this to turn into a, like, move your money to advance it, but those are where these questions came up. But I will say, and I've had experience um, with other um you know, folks like Advanta, but the, the problem is if you don't have a dedicated person that you're going to call and they know you and you know them, here's another problem. They could be brand new and they don't know squat about a lot of things and they have to go ask somebody or they don't ask somebody. And they, anyway, I'm just telling you, it's a very big deal to know that you're with an organization that's going to put you with somebody and that person is going to be with you. Okay. And they're going to know things. All right. So Larissa's still with us. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I am. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you just make my heart stop every time that screen goes black like that. Cause I know what that means is that 
that maybe Catherine or Adrian are going to have to take over the meeting for the night. So I'm just letting them know, giving them a heads up. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I won't, I won't bail on you guys. I just had to hand something to the baby. I figured you didn't want to see me like lean over the computer and all that stuff. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, um, so I think we left off on, um, you know, looking for alternatives. So, you know, when you're talking to your investor, so we talked about the repeat investor. So, you know, the great thing is that you have a private money lender that you enjoy working with, right? And you want them to um, reach into their IRA so that they can continue to work with you even when maybe they have all of their personal cash deployed. So repeat investors are great. Um, people looking for alternatives. So, you know, when you're raising capital um, and you you say, hey, you can um, use your IRA or 401k to invest with me. And as Adrian said, diversify your portfolio. Many people, again, looking at the market might say, I really don't want to be wholly invested into the market. And when you tell them, hey, you can use an IRA, I don't know if you knew that, they might be like, I didn't know that. And now I can really truly diversify instead of being stuck with this sort of list of investments that, um, you know, my brokerage account is providing me. So, you know, that that tends to be pretty big in, in the world of people who, you know, they have, um, they don't have a whole lot of time to invest and they prefer to invest with you so that you can kind of handle it. And we'll talk about two types of investors in a minute, but uh, you guys know what that investor looks like. Somebody that says, I have the money, but I don't have the time. So here's the money, make the investment and let's agree on a, on a rate of return. Um, the next one is uh, not expecting to use the IRA funds too soon. So another reason that IRAs are a great source of capital. People are not going to be turning to that account anytime soon. They all know that they have to leave it, sort of set it and forget it, if you will, until age 59 and a half. And actually, I feel like many people don't know that retirement age, according to the IRS, is 59 and a half. And so they're kind of like, well, I can't touch that money until retirement, and I don't even know when that is. And so they're really looking to grow those funds in the meantime while they can't touch it. And so, again, most individuals don't plan on touching their IRA for years. They don't even consider it as something where they can uh, reach into it and use it for something, um, you know, like house repairs, for example. And of course, again, we talked about trillions in retirement plans, and most of that is not self-directed. So you have all of this capital, again, pretty liquid capital available to use for making investments. Um, and so we talked about, you know, I was going to kind of go over a quick list of investments that are allowed within a retirement account. And there really isn't a definitive list by the IRS. It's more that the IRS has said that you can um, make investments, and as long as they're not in these two asset classes, and as long as they are not um, with certain disqualified persons, then you are going to be able to make those investments. And so really, and um, I'm yeah. sorry, guys, I know you can hear the little one in the background, but. No, you're good. You're very good. I was just going to point out to everybody, listen, this is a good list for you to have because when you're talking to someone as a potential private lender to you, you want to talk with authority that you know where they can invest those retirement funds. You don't want to be wishy-washy about it. So anytime Larissa is here talking about as if it's your retirement fund she's talking about where you can invest, understand this is also information you use with the private lender saying, well, listen, if you've got money sitting in your retirement account, here's the things that are absolutely allowed blah, 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 blah. It makes you look like a great expert on that. So just remember that. Take these notes. Definitely. And, and we'll talk about some tools that we can provide you guys for making investments as well. Um, you know, we can do private, um, some private webinars and stuff for you. And so, for example, Liz, I might re-record this for you for it to share with the group so that there's not the baby in the background. But um, um, but, okay. basically, <laughs> but, but basically, we can put together, you know, if you guys are looking for specific information, if you say, hey, I would really like to have information on how people can lend money to me, then I'll just talk about private lending, for example, and I'll talk about that with you guys in just a minute. But um, basically, the different types of investments, um, we see a lot of buy and hold real estate, we see people invest in commercial real estate, and sometimes commercial real estate is more like syndications, but we do have people own commercial real estate in their IRA, fixer uppers or fix and flips, condos, duplexes, multifamily investments, syndications, 
private REITs, and I do specify here private because um, there are a lot of publicly traded REITs as well. So you just want to be aware that if it's something privately held, that is something we can hold, um, but we don't hold anything publicly traded at all. And then of course land, and a lot of times people will make um, investments into land, they do some land speculating, that is something you can do with an IRA. I like to point that one out because if you make an investment into land and you're not gonna have rental income on that land, people will say, well, am I allowed to make this investment? It's not gonna generate any income. The idea is buy it, hold it, and hopefully it's worth a whole lot more in a year, two years, 10 years, or 30 years, or whatever your strategy is. And the IRS does not say that your investment has to have income. Um, so if you think about something like that, where you could really buy a small property or buy a property that's you know, pennies on the dollar or something like that, and you plan on turning around and selling it in five years, as long as the IRA can cover the expenses, so like the real estate taxes, for example, then you can make that investment. And I won't go too much into the rules with you guys, but that just gives you an idea of the investments you can make. Um, and as I said too, you can also make investments into things like gold and silver, bars and coins, and cryptocurrency. And you can buy, um, you can do futures trading, for example. Um, we've had clients, um, we have a whole webinar on unique investments. So we've had clients that have bought airplanes in their IRA and lent money based on um, with alpaca as collateral. We've seen clients invest in cows and bulls and all kinds of racehorses. And so the list really truly does go on and on, but that just kind of gives you an idea of the truly alternative side of self-direction. So I talked about the different types of accounts. And so I have them listed up here for you guys, but basically anything that ends in IRA can be self-directed. Um, I also have up here solo 401k or qualified record keeping plan. A lot of times people have heard of those, um, but a solo 401k basically is a QRP. Um, education savings accounts and health savings accounts, those can all be self-directed. And then, of course, I talked about how it's a former employer plan typically, but you certainly can check with your current employer to see if you can make that investment or uh, do that rollover, excuse me. We talked about transfers and direct rollovers, and basically a transfer is IRA to IRA. A direct rollover would be anything from an old employer plan over to the retirement account. And that money, in either of these, the money is gonna come over directly. So you're not going to be moving money um, to your personal bank account, for example, and then moving it to the retirement account. You're simply going to ask Advana, hey, this is the type of account I have, or this is the type of account my investor has. What do I do with this? And then they're gonna tell you, okay, this is a transfer trustee to trustee, or this is a direct rollover, whichever it might be. Um, the two asset classes that the IRA or the IRS does not allow, here they are, life insurance and collectibles. Really just about anything else is allowed with the exception of dealing with disqualified persons. So anybody that is related to the IRA holder, such as your spouse, your parents, your grandparents, your children, your grandchildren, or spouses or business entities of those those people are gonna be considered disqualified. And so when you're looking at who you're transacting with, you always wanna have those investments at an arm's length. Now, when you're dealing with private money lenders and raising capital, typically you're not looking towards your family, but I'll be honest, sometimes people do come to me and say, well, my mom wants to lend me money from my IRA. And that would be something that would be considered prohibited. Um, so you just wanna keep that in mind and make sure that you're dealing with people at an arm's length. To that transaction. Um, and then the other thing I always like to make people aware of is when, a ta when tax may apply to an IRA, and that's unrelated business income tax. And um, sometimes it's also interchangeable with UDFI or unrelated debt finance income tax. And um, basically, there's two scenarios. One is when um, real estate is purchased using financing, that's one. And that could even be true when it's a limited partnership. So we'll talk very briefly about that as well. And then also when business income is returned to an IRA. That's atypical. Income is typically not considered business when it's being returned to an IRA. It's typically interest income or passive income. Um, I'm not gonna define it for you here. I'm not a CPA, so I'm really not comfortable defining it. Um, but we do have a whole webinar on UBIT if you guys are interested in that.
And I am going to put you guys on hold for just a second. Um, Liz, if you want to check to see if there's any other questions, and I'll be right back. Okay, no problem. So let's see. Um, okay, we have Catherine's over there. We'll ask that question in a little bit. And anything else anybody else would like to, to add to this now to kind of help her doing her mommy time right now? <laughs> so just, just so I fully understand basically what she's saying, so basically we can take our money and put it into an Advanta IRA as a retirement fund and then take that money and borrow it back out to buy real estate, to do all these type of transactions or to loan it to somebody who's doing a real estate transaction or such is, is essentially what she's saying, right? Well, you can't, right, but you can, no, you can't, you have prohibited people and you're, <laughs> you loan it to other people and there are certain things that you do in your right. real estate and ask, have her clarify that. But the way the thing to think about it is anyone who's literally, uh, you know, up or down, like across, like your parents or your right. children or grandchildren. So there are prohibited people that you can't do business with. And um, yeah, there becomes a thing there. So maybe have her clarify that a little right. bit. Exactly. She, she yeah. explained that. Yeah. I'm saying, yeah. but. The essence, the essence of it, Ryan, is yes, you can open an account, put your money in there, and then that can be used to invest. And you're not paying taxes on that right away. There's, you know, deferred on that or not at all in some instances. But yeah, good point, Susan. We'll have her um, ver verify that more. Right. Okay, and actually, it, that's a Roth IRA. If you do the traditional, they're set up just like every traditional investment. I mean, then you pay tax on it when you take it out and you get the you get the break. At, so let's say you have a W two job and you make your contributions and you want to choose a traditional instead of a Roth, because all these are, they go by all the same guidelines, no matter what investment you have in it, then you would pay you would pay tax on the gains, but you would get a break on your contributions. Or if you right. didn't want to take the break on your contributions now, and you wanted to, you have, you know, because I mean, literally, if you're self-directing, you can make a lot of money in there, right? You can take a minimal amount of money like a hundred dollars or so and put something, you know, put an option on something. And then realistically it could sell for a whole lot more in the future. And if you put that in a traditional IRA, then you're going to pay tax on all that gain when you take it out. Whereas if you put it in the Roth IRA, then all of that tax, you're, you don't have to pay that because you didn't get the break, you know, up front. I understand that. Yes. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. So the way, else. thank you. <laughs> Just jumping in, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Susan, and that's a great point. It's you know the way that we like to think about it is that if you have a Roth IRA, you're paying tax on the seed, but not on the tree. And if you have a traditional IRA, you're not paying tax on the seed, but you are on the tree. So you're you're going to pay ordinary income tax at the time of distribution for any pre-tax account that you guys have. Um, and so that's just important to keep in mind. But the fact that it is self-directed isn't changing that. It, it's not changing the way the IRA is structured. And so if you have your account with Morgan Stanley or Fidelity, and it's currently pre-tax, and it comes over to us pre-tax, those rules are the same. So remember, self-direction defines the investment, not the account. Um, so if you have a Roth IRA, for example, then you guys are probably familiar with the five-year rule. The Roth IRA has to age for five years and you have to reach age 59 and a half for that account to be tax-free. And so if you move your Roth IRA over from Fidelity and it's been there for 15 years, the aging just comes with the account. So you don't have to worry about that. And you know, you're just gonna continue to treat it as a Roth just as you always would. And so I mentioned that tax and we don't see that apply very often, but it's just something to be aware of because if you're looking at investments that might be structured, for example, like a limited partnership or you're raising capital in a limited partnership, um, then your IRA investors could be, not always, but could be exposed to that tax that I mentioned on the previous slide. And I think Ryan had a question that I missed also about prohibited transactions. Yeah, Ryan, can you um, say your question again to make sure yeah. that we've covered it for you with the rest Yeah, time? sure. My question was just making sure that I fully understood kind of how Advanta IRA works. And I'd asked, I said, uh, so basically, like you're talking about rolling over an account. So we're just taking our tr traditional, however you have it set up, 
IRA and moving it over to Ad Advanta instead of Fidelity or any of those other ones, but that we can use that money to purchase a real estate investment property or loan that out to somebody else uh, that's at arm's length, correct? That's yes. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, a lot of times when we talk about the rules then people say, well, if I can't take this money and do my own deals, then I don't want to do it. It really is still your own deal. But the way that I like to phrase it is that think of your IRA as your business partner. So, you know, if you find one, two, three Main Street, and it's a great deal and you want to buy it and you say, you know what, this one might be a good one for my IRA. I'm going to make this investment. Then as long as you haven't, like, as long as you don't own it currently, previous, like, you know, personally, and it's right. not owned by some disqualified person, then that's an investment you can make. And it really is still your deal. It's just that your business partner, your IRA is coming in and making the purchase and paying expenses and receiving income. So that's kind of how I like to think about it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, and then private lending. I mean, you know, I do some private lending with my 401k. And so basically, you know, I looked to find the deal that I wanted to do. I didn't have somebody else do it for me. You know, I looked at the property and the, um, the borrower, made sure I was comfortable with that deal and then made the investment. So it's still a, an investment of mine, but I made it through my retirement account. So I hope that helps clarify. Okay. Um, I believe Dory has a question for you, Dory. Yeah, I wanted uh, two clarifications. One thing Ryan said was take that money out. And it actually, I don't think it counts as a distribution. You're replacing the money with a note or with a piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a distribution. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing about the disallowed parties, you can actually do a joint venture with a disallowed party where they cannot lend to you. Is that correct, Larissa? That that's correct. You're absolutely right. And I think that's a fantastic point. So thank you for making it. It is not a distribution from the retirement account. And that is a question that gets asked a lot. People will say, well, I, you know, how quickly do I have to put the money back in? I thought it was 60 days or something like that. And they're thinking of the 60 day distribution rule. Um, but the truth is that it is an investment of the IRA account. I think it's very normal for us to think about stock in our retirement account and say, well, they're stuck in there. It's held by the retirement account. But does anybody ever think about how it's titled? That stock is actually titled in the name of the retirement account, but we really don't have to deal with that, right? The brokerage house does. So when you have a self-directed IRA, it's more upfront and you're seeing that paperwork more directly. And so now you know it's actually titled in the name of the retirement account. And that's part of what we do is we make sure that those investments are titled in the name of the IRA so that they get their proper titling. It shows an investment of the account, so it retains its tax deferred or tax-free status, and that investment is now made by the IRA account. I once had somebody ask me um, where the money, you know, she showed me a statement from another self-directed IRA because she was transferring over. She said, where is the money? And I, I looked at the statement and I said, well, it's, it's in this piece of real estate that you purchased. And she was like, I don't know why I asked that question because I, I already knew that, but you know, sometimes we just, we don't, when we're not familiar with it, we're not thinking about how the asset is held and it's in the retirement account. It's actually in the retirement account. If you look on, um, you know, probably any of the county websites locally and put in Advanta IRA, you're going to see deeds, titles in the name of IRA accounts held by our clients. And that's, that's important. That retains a tax deferred status. While we're on this, could you just add, let's say I have a previous job and I've got some money sitting out there and it's not really doing anything, but it's in a traditional status. Could, have you seen or how, what was the best way that you've seen people maybe if they chose to, or as to maybe get some of that on a, you know, timely basis, maybe so much annually or something into a Roth IRA. So I don't have to pay the tax in a big chunk so that it doesn't always have to be that traditional, even though it is that way, because most um, investment, you know, that you offered by a company, it is the traditional way. So how, what would you see, see, or what's the best way you've seen to, to maybe roll that over and just take bites of that every year so you don't have to claim all of that as income to mm -hmm. maybe, you know, convert that to a Roth IRA. So when you do make a lot of money in it, that you don't have to pay tax on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a great point, Susan. I'm not a CPA. So what I'm going to tell you is just check with your CPA on the best way to do that. But I'll tell you ways I've seen it done. And you're absolutely right. You can convert to Roth IRAs over time. 
um, you can do it all at once. It, it really doesn't matter. Even if you have your modified adjusted gross income means that you can't contribute to a Roth IRA, you can still um, do, pay the taxes, do a Roth conversion and get the money into a Roth IRA. You don't have to have an existing Roth. You can start with a new one. You can do a little bit over time. Or if you have a lot of losses in a year, for example, we've seen people do it then. You can convert some money on December 31st and you can convert some money on January 1st. And now you've divided some of that burden among two years. Um, because the conversion is taxable in the year that it happens then. So that's kind of what we see people do. They kind of consider the investment that they're making and determine whether or not they want it to grow tax deferred in the, the account they have versus maybe converting it prior to making the investment and having it grow tax free. You can also convert investments. So you can do that. But there's a couple extra steps in there. We need a fair market value form that basically tells us what the value of that investment is. We need a third party valuator signature on that. And you know, sometimes it's very straightforward. Sometimes it might be an interest only note, for example. And so if it's an interest only note, you know, the, the value is probably the principal value of the note, but we still require a third party valuator on something like that. So just Keep that in mind if you're thinking about doing what we call an in-kind Roth conversion, but that's a great point and you can do that at any time and it doesn't matter what your modified adjusted gross income is. Would you share with us what the current um, contribution rates are according to your age? Maybe everyone doesn't know that. If I want to continue, if I have a, what, what, what would I need, to, what position would I need to be in to continue to contribute and how much can I contribute? And are there any age limits? Can I have an IRA for a minor child that I can invest? I mean, so could you kind of share that, your point, thing of thought? Yep, yep. So um, it's 6,000 for a traditional or Roth IRA. It's 7,000 if you're over the age of 50. Um, you can contribute to a retirement account as long as you have earned income. So that actually changed with the SECURE Act. Um, many of us may rec recall that once you reached a certain age with a traditional IRA, you could no longer contribute even if you had earned income, but that changed. So as long as you have earned income, you can contribute to any retirement account. However, you may have to take distributions as well. So some of you might be refer, uh, uh, familiar, excuse me, with the term required minimum distribution. You still may be required to take a distribution from the account, which I know it sounds a little counterintuitive, but it's the IRS. And then you can still make a contribution as long as you have that earned income. And you can, and earnings are unlimited. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter um, what your tax status is. It doesn't matter if you have earned income earnings in your retirement account are unlimited. Um, so that's important to know. I think Susan also asked about, um, you know, minor children. As long as your children have earned income, you can contribute for to an IRA for them, or they can make contributions to an IRA up to the amount they earned or the limit. And that's true for really anybody. So if you just have $4,000 this year of actual earned income rather than passive, but earned income, then you can only contribute 4,000. And that would be the same with a minor child. As long as they had earned income, you can make contributions either on their behalf or they can do it with their earnings. Any other questions on that? Thank you. And I know because now they've got where you can, you know, basically pay your kids, you used to have to do the kitty tax. So let's say I have a child that I do hire to clean my office and whatever little, you know, filing duties or whatever, but because of what type of documentation, do we have to do a tax return on them at this? Maybe that's too dectical, but so let's say I pay them for that. So they have earned income, but because they are my minor child, if I don't pay them over a certain amount, I'm not required to do a tax return for them. Would I need to do that to quantify, you know, to basically that would be a CPA question, maybe? It, it is, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, okay. Susan. I, I honestly don't know the answer to that, and I have been okay. asked that on a few occasions. I don't know the answer to that. Um, okay. I know that I've taken Dykes Botiford's ta advanced uh, tax planning strategies a few times, and they go over that, but I really don't know the answer, so I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, no worries. And, and I was just thinking about it recently, because in the past, you had to do the little kitty tax returns. So there was no question that the child made money, even though you didn't really, it didn't go anywhere. It's just more of a reporting process. So, and I, so I, I actually, that is, what does, what does Dyke say on that? Does he, what's his take on it? 
I really don't remember. I probably have to go back to my book and look at it. And I, it's been like two years since I took that class. Um, but he might have a resource for you. So you could always check out his website and see if there's information. Awesome. There. Yeah, no, definitely not. Now I'm going to write that down because I don't have any minor children right now, but, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> but definitely, I think it's a great thing for, for those people who do, you know, because unlike some of the education programs, they're limited just to that education. Whereas if you have children, especially if they go into real estate or whatever, they may take that Roth IRA and buy a house or whatever, a down payment on a house, or there's just, if they get a scholarship, then there's just so much flexibility in addition to just an education type, I feel. That's just my personal opinion. Where's our disclaimer when you need it? Okay. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah, I'm just um, yeah, much more flexible. And in, in also in a question that Catherine had a little bit earlier is a B&B venue, it's a turnkey already set up business, is that an option? I'm assuming, uh, Catherine, you meant an option to be able to invest in with a Roth IRA. Yeah. Um, so a turnkey business, is that what you said, Liz? Yes. Well, it's a B and B. Is that what you're asking about, Catherine? Yes, a B and B slash venue. That's already a turnkey. Um, I'm interested in buying one, and so I just wondered if that would be um, accepted. I normally would say that it might be a good thing to get a legal opinion on, making sure that the structure is done properly, because you want to make sure that you know you're not involved in the day to day. So, are you hiring management? Are you a passive investor? Do you have a partner that? excuse me, is um, sort of the active role and maybe your IRA would be the passive role um, because you can't have a current benefit from that investment and um, you don't want to be involved. So providing sweat equity is kind of how the IRS would deem that. Um, you don't want to provide sweat equity to the business because this investment should be for investment purposes to grow the retirement account, but not have having that role and providing sweat equity is going to be really important. Um, the second sort of tier to that is this maybe would trigger UBIT, so that tax that we talked about, unrelated business income tax, because if you if you have an active business in there, I have to imagine that, you know, unrelated business income tax is going to apply. I'm not a CPA or an attorney, but it, it sounds like that. Um, so if you're going to make that investment, then I would suggest talking to an attorney and just making sure it's structured properly for the IRA. And there's a couple good attorneys for self-directed retirement accounts, Jeff Watson and John Heyer, and either of those guys could help you um, and advise you on that deal. Okay. In, in fact, those are major players that she just mentioned. I, for all of you on this call tonight, I would write down their names or maybe Adrian, you can help me by putting their names over in the chat. Because if you find any classes that either of those guys are doing, go to them. They are major players in our arena for getting the right legal direction or things. In fact, they're, they're awesome. I mean, you just need to do that. Um, so Adrian will put that over there for you guys so that you have it. I'm glad that was brought up. Um, also, Larissa, before you get back on track there, uh, Andrew had a question for you and people want to know what he's talking about. He's saying, is the backdoor Roth going away? And okay. so he's asking that question. Okay. Um, you know, I think there was a lot of concern about losing the backdoor Roth with a lot of new legislature um, at probably around this time last year. Um, you and define so, what that is, though, for folks. Thank you. Please That's what I was going to say. What's a backdoor Roth? Yep, yep. So um, a backdoor Roth is basically if you have too much modified adjusted gross income. So remember, I mentioned that earlier. Um, if you have too much modified adjusted gross income, you cannot contribute directly to the Roth IRA. So um, it's not based on on earned versus passive. It's your modified adjusted gross income. So overall, and um, if it's too high, then you can't put that money into a Roth, but you can use this technique called a backdoor Roth IRA. And so what does that look like? Um, that What that means is basically that you establish a traditional IRA, you make your contribution to that IRA, and then we do that conversion. So we talked about that technique a little bit about converting over time or whatever. But typically when you're using a backdoor Roth, you're making your full contribution to a traditional and you're moving that full amount, so six or $7,000, directly into your Roth. And so we see a lot of times um, at contribution time each year, we see people doing that all at once. So we have a lot of like clients that do that every single year and they call us and say, okay, it's that time. I need to put this money into a traditional, I need to convert it over to a Roth. And 
anybody can do that. So it's not based on your earned income. It has to do with the fact that maybe you earn too much, um, so you can't go directly to a Roth. So you're doing that conversion from a traditional. So you're kind of going around the rules, and it is within the rules to convert and get money into a Roth IRA and have that tax-free growth. Now, sometimes you have too much in earnings and you don't even get a deduction for making a contribution for a traditional IRA, depending on a few different things. And so when you do that conversion, you know, it's sort of like moving across the line, but there may not be too much of a taxable event for you. But again, talking to a CPA about that. Um, sometimes we talk to people who make a contribution directly to a Roth. And at the end of the year, they find out they made too much. So they have to move it back to a traditional or they move it to a traditional and then reconvert it to the Roth in order to fix that mistake because they had too much in earnings. So it's just a, um, a strategy or technique we see people use when their modified adjusted gross income is over. And I won't swear to this, but it's, it's 190 something thousand married filing jointly. So it, it moves a little bit every year and it's, it starts at like around 196,000. It goes up to 206,000, I believe, but that would be an easy Google to see what the modified adjusted gross income limits are on Roth contributions each year. Um, they were going to sort of um, do some movement on IRAs during uh, around this time last year in some legislature and they took it off the table. So we still have uh, backdoor Roths and as far as I can see, there's nothing new that will be taking them away. I have a question for you then. So let's say the contribution is the six or the 7,000 according to your age. Is that an overall contribution? Because explain like what you meant by is if they over contributed, is that a timing issue that they're doing or? Can you only over contribute to a traditional IRA? Is that what it is or how, why was that? No, people, people do accidentally over contribute. They might contribute with like their brokerage IRA and then also make their contribution with uh, their self-directed IRA and then find out later that they accidentally did both in the same year um, because the six or 7,000, depending on your age, is an overall contribution. It is not per account. And so if you have, you know, your Morgan Stanley account or your Fidelity account, you make your contribution there, say on January 2nd, and then you get to December 31st of the same year and you can't remember if you contributed. So you do it again with a different custodian. It, you can't over contribute. Typically, you can't over contribute with the same account. So if, if you sent me a check and I deposited it to your IRA on January 2nd, and then you went to make a, a contribution on December 31st of the same year, then I would send your check back and say, our system says you already made this contribution and you can't over contribute. No, absolutely. But I have, I've heard some people that in a strategic way maybe have over contributed. So I, I really wanted you to kind of, I, I didn't feel like it was totally clear uh, to me even that um, how that process works and what that might entail like if i let's say i over contribute because i just accidentally or for whatever purposely or whatever like you know for whatever reason um because so does that become disallowed or how is that handled if i do over contribute is then that come off next year or so you have a certain amount of time to self-correct and over contribution um i don't know that people do it intentionally but once it's in if they have an investment with that money and they can't just distribute it, um, that might be a reason that it gets left in the account and the penalty is 6% for each year, I believe it is. It's 6%, I can't remember if it's every 12 months or I, I really can't remember, but it, it's 6%. So I have heard people say, well, if it's a 6% penalty for leaving in the over contribution, but the earnings on that money is 10, 15%, then they might leave it until that investment cash is out. That is not investment advice or tax advice at all. Please, you know, if you're looking at over contributing for whatever reason, please talk to your CPA because Absolutely. I don't know what kind of trouble you might get into if you over contribute on purpose. But, you know, the IRS often yeah. looks at, at intent. So, so be careful with those strategies. Absolutely. No, no, no. I meant maybe just there was an investment and they just needed like just a hair more. So they might, you know, or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I, I wouldn't do that on purpose either. I agree with you on that. Yeah. But I just wanted you to explain that just in case. Yeah. And, and that, that's really, that would be the reason that it gets allowed is if you've made a contribution with one firm and then you make a contribution with another, because typically you're not going to be able to over contribute. Now, another way you could over contribute maybe would be with um, an employer-based plan. Because like, for example, Advanta is not calculating your contributions for your 401k or your SEP IRA. We're not calculating those. 
So as long as it's within the limit, which this year would be 61,000, for example, then we're going to deposit the contribution. But if you get to the end of the year, let's say, and you found that you didn't earn as much as maybe you thought you were, and that's what you based your annual contribution on, that you maybe have over contributed there. And Advanza would allow that deposit because we're not calculating the contribution for you. And so then again, you have some time to correct that, and then a 6% penalty would be applied. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so we can go on um, now and, you know, guys, keep the questions coming. Um, I really appreciate that. I'm happy that I'm not just up here talking and talking. Um, so, you know, here we're talking about just different investment structures, um, basically, that we see capital raising um, for, and of course, hedge funds, and we all hear about those, and a lot of times, in, in even especially in the Tampa Bay area, we hear about hedge funds not only raising capital, but then out there buying real estate in our community um, with the capital that they raise, multifamily syndications, um, and actually, I had, um, I did a webinar with Jay Scott, and I heard him um, describe that this in, in a way that, you know, it, it completely made sense to me, but syndications you typically see um, raising capital for a specific deal and then a uh, they might be raising. And, and sometimes it's interchangeable, but limited partnership, they might be ra raising capital for a specific strategy. So you might have a syndication for buying, you know, park apartments at 123 Main Street, for example, but then a limited partnership, they might be buying a few apartment complexes in an area. That may not always be true, um, but I thought that was kind of an interesting way that it was defined. Um, we do see people raising capital with unsecured notes. I'll talk a little bit about that. Private startup companies raising capital, and sometimes we hear that termed um, like angel investing, for example. Um, real estate rehab projects, and of course, we're all very familiar with that, where you might uh, lend money either on the purchase or on the rehab, and then sometimes you see raising capital on both. So working with your, your private money lender, and they say, okay, well, I want you to have some skin in the game, so you need 20% down, but then I'll fund the purchase and the rehab of this property, or... They say, I'll fund the purchase, you have to fund the rehab, or you have to get a second mortgage with somebody else to fund the rehab, whatever it might be. We see private stock offerings for raising capital. So that would be um, pretty typical for something like, um, you know, local restaurants and breweries and banks. We see a lot of private uh, stock for uh, local banks as well. And then business ventures and joint ventures. Somebody on the call already mentioned joint venturing. So, you know, putting money together and having the IRA receive a portion of the upside. And I think it was also mentioned you can partner with whomever you want. So we talk about disqualified persons and people up and down your lineal tree and how you can't transact with those people. But you certainly can partner with anybody that you want and just making sure that if you are partnering with disqualified persons, that you're going into the investment when it's new to you and new to them, that's very important, that you're remaining at that percentage of ownership from the outset for the life of the investment, so you're never changing that percentage of ownership, and that you're not doing any transaction or trying to buy uh, one or the other partner out because that's very important as well. And I did a whole webinar on um, IRA and non-IRA fund partnering. So I definitely would recommend that if you're looking at partnering with somebody that's either considered disqualified or if you're partnering non-IRA and IRA funds. Um, so two different types of investors, and you guys are probably all very familiar with this, the active investor, somebody who's out there buying rentals, doing rehabs, they're wholesaling, um, they are looking for control, they're sort of a decision maker, and um, it takes a lot of time, energy, and responsibility. And you know what, this active investor might be the capital raiser, right? So if you're out there and you're their mover and the shaker in the deal, you're probably raising capital. And then you have the passive investor, somebody who's busy, they have a W-2, nine to five type of job, um, they don't have time, or maybe they don't have the knowledge. So they want to go in on real estate, but they don't have the knowledge to make those investments without the active investor. Um, they don't have the time, they're looking for mailbox money. I think we've all heard that term before. And they don't really necessarily want control over that investment. Or sometimes they see that as, you know, like the pro versus the con. But many times when you have the passive investor, they're okay with less control because they really don't want to necessarily be responsible for the day-to-day -day of that investment. They want to set it and forget it, so to speak. So those are the, the two types of investors. And so, you know, really we could categorize the active investor as the capital raiser and the passive investor as the um, investor really for this purpose. 
So when you're raising capital, how can you do that? Well, it could be a traditional mortgage. You could lend money on 123 Main Street, for example. It could be a five-year, a 15-year, a 30-year. It could be a one-year. You know, if you're just rehabbing and you're looking for short-term capital, and, um, you know, I thought it was interesting in the exchange meeting this morning because we talked about short-term and, you know, I do a lot of the entering. And when I somebody says, I want it to be short-term, then I have to say, what do you consider short-term? Because that's just based on everybody's opinion. <laughs> short-term for me is six months to a year. Short-term for somebody else in the meeting today was five years. And so short-term um, for Wayne, he always says this is 30 to 50 years. So, so everybody has an idea of what short-term is and what they're looking to get. And so when you're raising capital, talking to your investors and finding out what they're looking for and structuring a deal based around that is usually what we see. Um, short-term or transactional funding, you might have an A to B and B to C closing and you need money in between. We see that in an IRA account. Unsecured promissory notes. I know this is surprising people, but we do see a lot of unsecured lending. Um, for our purposes, something unsecured would be, um, you know, if it, it doesn't have a mortgage or a deed of trust tied to it. Um, sometimes we'll see things that have, um, you know, non-real estate uh, tied to it or security. And I'll not, I'm not really going to talk about that right now, but in my webinar today earlier, I did talk about it. So if you guys are looking to find out more, um, you can certainly go to the recording for that. But um, a reason somebody might lend unsecured and a reason somebody might raise capital unsecured, it's quicker. You know, there's no uh, formal closing involved in an unsecured note. Um, somebody might say, well, we're going to do this unsecured now. We'll secure it with a mortgage or a deed of trust later on. Sometimes we do see that as well. Um, but if you're lending money unsecured, what's required? Just the promissory note. That's it. And because the note is the um, instrument for the investment, we do need the original signed note in order to fund. So when you are lending money, if you're going to lend it unsecured, just be mindful that you have to sign that no, uh, the borrower has to sign the note, deliver it to Advanta, and then Advanta will fund because we need that security instrument at Advanta in safekeeping prior to funding. So that's just something to know. And there's some reasons yeah. there why people would do it. Well, so let me ask you that because I just had one happen like that. Um, so now does Advanta keep the, the unsecured promissory note or is that after funding given to the lender? Nope. It's, or where it, is that? It stays with Advanta. We, we keep it in safekeeping. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, equity participation, again, when you're lending money and you have the, the lender, maybe participate a little more than just interest. So they might say, okay, well, I'll lend you money, um, but I don't just want, you know, 8% and pay back in a year. I want 8% and I want a third of the profits. Um, or I want 5% and half of the profits or whatever the deal is negotiated at. And we do see that a lot. And, you know, that person might be involved a little more. They might say, well, I see the property is worth X, Y, Z, but I'm going to give you draws on the money. I'm not just going to give you all of the money. I want to make sure that, you know, whatever amount of work you say is going to be done in a month, two months, three months gets done. So I'm going to check on it and then I'll release more money to you. That would be pretty typical as well. Um, and then syndications and, of course, limited partnerships, and they're specific to a dealer strategy. Um, so now I'm going to talk specifically about some case studies for you guys um, so you can kind of see how it works. And then we'll talk about um, what tools we can help you with and how what that looks like. Um, so we talked about, you know, why raising capital with self-directed IRAs. We talked about reasons that you might talk to somebody about that. Um, before I go on to the case studies, does anybody have specific questions on, you know, talking to their private money lenders or when they're raising capital, you know, what that conversation looks like? Um, yes, I actually have a text from someone that was asking basically that was just asking if you were going to cover anything tonight that would help them be able to uh, approach that conversation, like start that conversation of would you, you know, lend from your Roth IRA? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it's not much different than what I do. Um, you know, when I talk to people, I think sometimes retirement accounts tend to be a, a very personal topic for people. And so normally when I talk to people about retirement accounts, and of course, I don't think you guys can see it, but I have my Advanta IRA shirt on, but I don't always. And so it's not always very clear what I do. And so sometimes I talk to people and I say, well, 
Um, you know, I work for Advana. We do self-directed IRAs. But but if people don't know me or they don't know what I do, um, you know, we're just talking about making investments. Well, you know, I see people invest with self-directed retirement accounts. Are you familiar with that? Or if they say I'm a private money lender and I'm looking for deals, just very simply, oh, have you ever done a deal out of an IRA before? You know, something like that. Just, you know, I think when people are investors, they're they're more likely to talk to you about that. And so if you're talking to people who haven't typically invested, we'll talk about some tools that you can use for those people as well. Okay, I think that would be great for a couple of them that are on the call tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, funding a, a rehab project with a private money loan. So um, we're going to talk about both ends of this deal. Bill bought a, a house and he needs a private investor for some cash to uh, basically fund the rehab. And this is probably a scenario that's very familiar to you guys. Um, so Bill has known Stephanie for a few years and he explains to Stephanie how she can use her old 401k funds to invest in real estate. So again, you know, just having that conversation and saying, you know, I'm raising capital, I'm looking for investors. And, you know, instead of saying, do you have money in an IRA? You could always say something like, I'm looking for investors and I accept IRA funds. If you have money in an IRA, I can accept that money in, in the form of a note and mortgage to make that investment. So it doesn't have to be, oh, well, if you don't have personal cash, do you have IRA money? It could be, you know, I'm raising capital. If you're looking to get invested into real estate and you wanna do some private money lending, you can do it with personal cash, but you can do it with an IRA also. And most of the time that is going to trigger a conversation because people just don't know about it. Um, Stephanie is going to do her due diligence on the property and again, being familiar with Bill in this example. So I think that's always important on both ends of the deal. Know who, who you're dealing with because you're going into this and you're going to be working together for the life of the investment. Uh, Stephanie is going to roll over money from her old 401k and puts it into an IRA with Advanza. And then her and Bill are gonna work out the terms. So, you know, she's really, she's the private money lender. She's gonna agree to those terms for her retirement account. Advanza really does not get involved here. You know, sometimes people ask me, well, what's a typical rate of return in a retirement account for private money lending? And I'll be honest, it depends on the market. It depends on the deal. It depends on the risk. So there are a lot of factors there that are gonna come into play for these types of deals. And so, you know, if you're looking for a super, uh, super safe spot, if you want to be low loan to value, if you want to have something that has great collateral and is long term, you might be looking at a lower interest rate. If you're looking at, you know, you're willing to lend as a second mortgage, it could be short term, you're charging points typically, um, not always, but sometimes, and you might have a little bit higher of an interest rate because you're in that second position, and maybe it's a little more risky. And so that kind of gives you an idea of what we're seeing, but it is always going to be based on the market, the deal, and what position you're in and, and things of that nature. Um, so they work out the terms. And basically on title, um, the note and mortgage and de or deed of trust are going to be showing the IRA as the lender. So the, the title, remember the buyer here is Bill. It's not Stephanie's IRA. She's lending the money. So the buyer is going to be Bill, and that could be Bill LLC or Sunshine LLC or whatever it is that he is utilizing as a structure to purchase that real estate. But who is the lender in this case? Well, it's the IRA. So Advanced IRA, LLC, SBO, Stephanie S, IRA number 1234. Now, Stephanie can choose to leave her name off of it. She can just lend with her account number. That would certainly be fine. But we're using an identifier here. We're saying, okay, well, it's Advanta IRA as the custodian or trust, uh, excuse me, administrator. But who is it? We have to identify your account somehow. So it's either your name, your name and your account number, or just your account number. And we leave that up to you. Documents for the investment are provided to Advanta. So we don't, remember, we don't give any legal advice. So we also don't prepare any legal documents either. So that's very important. It's going to be up to you. And um, so you as the borrower, you as the lender to put together the note and mortgage or whatever investment documents would apply. You can certainly work with an attorney. You can do it through a title company. You can work with other investors that say, hey, you know, I've been doing private lending a lot of years. This is the structure of the note and mortgage that I use. But again, making sure that both parties review and agree on those investment documents. And then Advanta will come in and say, okay, well, the lender is going to be Advanta IRA SBO Stephanie. And we're going to make sure that we see that lender titled in that way wherever it, it needs to be. And then from there, we have Stephanie read and approve the investment documents. We want to make sure that she has reviewed it and this is the deal she's agreeing to. And then once she does that, we can fund that investment. So again, 
from both sides. The loan amount was 50,000 with an interest rate of 5%, but she was getting 25% of the profits. It was a one year balloon with a monthly payment of 270 and she got a first mortgage on the property. Um, for Bill, he's gonna have his attorney prepare the note and mortgage. He reads and approves all the documents and sends them to Advanta. Or actually, that's reversed. I'm sorry about that. Stephanie is going to read and approve all the documents because she's lending the money. And then once Bill finds a buyer for the property, he sells it and he has 40000 in uh, profits. And Stephanie is going to provide the payoff amount. She is going to send it over to the title company. And then earnings and profit are going to go back to the IRA. So remember, again, in this scenario, your IRA is sort of like your business partner. Your IRA put all the money in. It's going to get all the money back plus the earnings. Again, talking about both sides, so the private money lender, Stephanie's IRA, repaid $50,000, received $1,600 in monthly payments and got 25% of the profits, so her total earnings were $11,600. And then Bill, he was the borrower, profits on the sale, $40,000, he repaid the loans, and um, there are his, his earnings as well. So we like to talk about both sides. Um, so you can kind of see how this worked out for everybody. And so, again, when you're raising capital, you know, looking at it from both sides and, you know, um, everybody wants to profit in the deal. And so working with your uh, lenders or however you're raising capital so that it works out for you guys. And in the end, you might have repeat uh, customers for that and for other investments. Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so we're going to talk, and I'm going to go through uh, multifamily syndications pretty quickly. I don't know if anybody in here raises capital with syndications, but basically it's just going to be based on paperwork, and typically you're going to see um, some subscription agreement or something that applies to that investment, but it's just another way to raise yeah. capital. We don't have, we don't really have very many in the group that do that size of investment. Okay, okay, gotcha, okay. So I'll just go through it really quickly. Um, Jane is um, purchasing and remodeling an apartment complex and raising capital in the form of a syndication. Um, you have different levels of syndications. Of course, you're going to have your friends and family capital raises, and then you're going to have your accredited investor types of capital raises, and they come with their own rules. I'm not going to go over that, I'm, especially because I'm not very familiar with them, but just knowing that if you're um, raising capital in the form of a syndication, it's best to get an attorney in involved and make sure that you're doing everything properly. Um, but the paperwork is different. So this isn't a note like the previous one. There's a subscription agreement for this one. Uh, there's a pamphlet basically that says in the subscription agreement what is expected and what the investor can expect, what the rate of return will be. There's typically going to be um, a minimum rate of return, something that is returned either monthly or quarterly to the IRA. And then there is going to be an amount that's paid back after the sale or the um, refinancing of that property. And that would be pretty typical. Um, we have lots of webinars on this, so I won't spend a whole lot of time since it's not much interest to the group. But just know that we have a lot of webinars that talk about raising capital through syndications and limited partnerships and what that looks like and how returns are sent back to retirement accounts for you guys. Um, so using an IRA in a leveraged investment, and, um, you know, we talked a little bit about UBIT. I'm really not going to go too much into it here. Um, you know, we'll save the um, time for something if you guys have more, some more questions. But just knowing that if you're purchasing real estate, and it's in the IRA, and you're going to use leverage, so you're going to buy with financing, you're going to expose the IRA to a tax called unrelated business income tax. And that tax is on the income related to the debt. So if you borrow 50%, and again, this is in the IRA, if you're borrowing 50%, then 50% of the income is going to be taxable. A 401k is at times exempt from UBIT if it's for purchasing real estate. So if you're financing to purchase real estate, and in some limited partnership investments, the 401k could be um, exempt from UBIT. It just depends. Um, so, and, and then there's here's there's some ways here to mitigate uh, paying that tax. So, using a C corp or C blocker, as some some people may have heard, and then um, how to handle UBIT, and that's listed here. And actually, um, my partner Alex does a great webinar on unrelated business income tax and when it applies and how. Um, to mitigate it. So if you guys are interested, you could check that out. 
Um, so how can we help you? And again, having that conversation, what that conversation looks like and um, what tools we can, can provide you in order to do that. And we always like to term this to sort of like mutual marketing. So, you know, it helps us when we help you. And of course we like to do it. We like working in our investment communities. And so a long time ago, we had to kind of, kind of come up with a way that we could work with the investor community, but still be compliant. Because as you guys know, many of you attend, like for example, our um, networking events and stuff, and you know that we can't put borrowers and lenders together. We're not allowed to do that. We wanna be very careful. We're at arm's length from any transaction. We do not do due diligence. We don't give investment advice. We don't sell investments. So we really need to remain that way. But some things that we can do, we can provide you a um, private landing page. And so if you're talking with somebody, for example, and they're considering investing with you and they're like, well, I'm not really sure I have the capital at this time, you might reply and just send a link and here, did you know that you can use retirement accounts? Check out this page. It has more information to, for you. And I have a, a picture of that on the next one, on the next slide. But um, basically all that landing page is, is your logo, your contact information, our contact information. And it says, hey, did you know that you could invest with whoever? using a retirement account. This is how it works. This is how you get started. And so it, it, the purpose of that private landing page is that it looks like it's yours, but it talks about how to use IRAs or 401ks when they're investing with you. So that might be an easier conversation if you have a piece to share with them first. And we can do also marketing flyers. I just don't get much demand for marketing flyers anymore, um, but something to keep in mind. Um, we can also do um, infographics for um, social media. So if you're on social media a lot and you're talking about raising capital or you're talking about your projects, for example, and maybe you don't solicit on social media, but maybe you talk about projects you're involved in, you know, using an infographic that says IRAs can invest in real estate. Did you know that? People might reach out to you just to learn about that because they had no idea. And so we can do private or um, custom uh, social media infographics for you for that as well. And again, your contact information, our contact information and how it works. And we can work with you on what kind of language you wanna include in there. Um, but we have some pretty standard stuff that we use as well. Uh, private webinars. So again, I already mentioned that where we can um, put a private webinar together for you, for you to share with potential investors. So again, that conversation may be sounding like, um, I know you're thinking about investing in real estate. I do real estate and I'm always looking for money. If you'd like to learn about how you can maybe make that investment, stay a passive investor and do it through your retirement account, I can share this link with you where Larissa or Alex talks about making those investments through a retirement account. We can do that with you. We can do it just a quick recording on our own, whatever you guys want. And then of course our networking event. We have a networking event every other week Everybody is welcome to join. It's very informal. And it's basically us saying, hey, we can't put borrowers and lenders together, but we can all get together in this format and talk about what you're looking for or what you have. And um, you can bring it to that meeting. And we'd love to have everybody on there at any time. So um, here's some examples of the landing page here on the uh, left side, and then the marketing uh, flyers that we have done on the right. And you know, Again, not too many people use marketing flyers anymore, but you can kind of um, see how that would make a good um, uh, infographic for social media. We probably use more um, graphics there and um, maybe the one, two, three, four, five steps that you see, use some pictures, make it look really nice for social media. I actually have a few of those. Um, but the private landing page, you can see here that it's sort of um, just, you know, a blank slate. And so if you said, well, I want it to say invest with, um, you know, ABC Capital using an IRA and reach out to um, abc.com to find out more or whatever it is, we can do all of those things. And we can include a link to the application packet. We can include um, really just about anything that you want. And that might be a very helpful tool to you guys so that you can say, oh, well, I'm raising capital. I'm looking for, um, you know, XYZ amount. Here's some information on how you can make that investment if you don't want to do it with personal cash. Um, so our Pitch, Promote, and Prosper, again, it's just um, Advanced IRA hosting it. We have people join nationwide. And I would encourage everybody that's raising capital to join us there because this in, invite goes out to, I think it's like 30,000 contacts now. 
Um, we have about 30 to 40 people online every other week, but at one point we had 60 to 100 every other week. So I'd love to see that grow again. I'd love to see all of you guys on there talking about investments you have or asking questions of the, the investor community that's on there or what have you. So hopefully you guys will consider that too on your uh, capital raising journey. And that's all I have for you guys. Is there more questions for me? I have some. What do you charge to do that landing page? I don't charge anything. Wow. And then what about trusts? Can uh, IRA lend to a land trust? Sure. Yep. And can an IRA uh, be part of a land trust, the beneficiary, and maybe yes. to get their money in instead of? Yes. Okay. Yep, yep, the IRA would be the grantor and the beneficiary. And if you're partnering into a trust, we could talk about what that looks like. Yep. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, where do we get the address to join that uh, class on Friday afternoons that you just uh, covered? So it's advanaira.com. You can kind of see it at the bottom there. Mine's covered up by my Zoom screen, but it's advanaira.com forward slash events. And then you'll just click on pitch, promote, and prosper. Adrian apparently uh, read my mind because he posted it right as I asked it. So perfect. Thanks, Thank Adrian. You. You're welcome. I'm signing up right now. I haven't been in a while. It's really good. And I'm signing up to keep myself to remember. Perfect. Thank you, Adrian. Anyone else questions? So I'll just take a moment and just remind everybody that we have webinars every week. We usually have two a week. And so if you guys want to learn more on a specific topic, um, so for example, again, you know, IRA accounts or retirement accounts for the self-employed, um, we have webinars on those specifically, but then we also talk different strategies and different structures of investments. We just did one on, um, on gold um, in an IRA. And Adrian, aren't you going to do a webinar with us on the 6th? Yes, I am. I'll be there Tuesday. Tuesday. So Tuesday, September 6th, Adrian's going to be talking. And so um, and again, all of our events are free. So this is a great opportunity to sort of hear his preview for his upcoming class. Um, and you can sign up again on the website, advanaira.com forward slash events. If you can't make it live, everything is recorded. You can go to our YouTube channel or our video library. If you sign up, you'll always get the link to the recording. So it's just an easy way to kind of stay up to date on all the webinars as they come through. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of what we do, guys, is we do a lot of education. And I hope that even if you're not ready to self-direct, if you're considering capital raising with an IRA, that you'll join some of those webinars. Because I also do think that familiarizing yourself with it is another really good way to talk about it with your investors. I couldn't agree more. I I like to learn a lot, of even some of the pretty advanced stuff. So then if I'm in the conversation, I can at least say, I know you can do this. Here's someone to talk to. And he, I, that's all I need to know. Just enough of like, yes, you can do this. I may not be the best person, but I've got someone for you. Awesome. Yeah, we got, I guess we got all the questions right in the middle. <laughs> well, that's it then. That's all I have for you guys. I will email the slides over to Liz so she can share them. So, she, so Liz, if you want to share them with the recording, you're welcome to do so. Yeah, and we'll probably have the recording up the next day or so, so on our YouTube. Okay, and uh, Adrian, if you, if you do need me to re-record it, I am happy to do so. I know the, the little one was a little loud at the beginning think, there, or think, sort of in the middle. <laughs> I think it was great. I mean, we, we have a very relaxed feel, so it fits right in. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that again, guys. Uh, I agreed to help Alex before right. I realized that uh, we had all of the activities tonight, so. <laughs> we Thank you for the presentation it. and information, Larissa. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys.
Thank you. Because if you didn't come, then I mean, I, I've seen you before, but I really enjoyed your presentation today. I heard some things I'd never heard before about the website and some other things. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. Yes. Yeah, thank I didn't you. know about that landing page. That's really cool. Yeah. I've had some Facebook pictures or the social media stuff created for me before, which was really nice. I, I forgot about it. So I'm going to be reaching out to get some more made. Yeah. And, you know, we can, you know, if you really have something specific that you're looking for. So, you know, Adrian, if you're looking for something like for your class, <clears throat> excuse me, we could do an infographic. We definitely have our logo on it. But if you wanted like, you know, to have an infographic that talks about your class or something like that, we could do that with you, too. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I switched over to Advantage because buy the coffee all the time for all these classes that we go to. So. <laughs> It's the least we can do. And then I've had great service and you and Alex awesome. are fantastic. And Scott, even though I haven't seen him in years and years, but uh, everyone I've ever met at Vanna has been fantastic. Well, thank you. And you go to the classes, not just to go and talk about Advanta. You go there and take notes. Yes, I do. I do. That's how I, I started, you know, lending money out of my 401k. And um, I always tell people I'm so lucky because you know, where, what I do at Advana really has enabled me to kind of grow as a person. <clears throat> Obviously, I didn't know about self-directed IRAs before I started at Advana. And then just being able to attend classes and be in the groups and everything, it really has helped me to grow and, you know, change my, my perspective on things. And I've learned so much about investing. And, you know, there was a time in college that I worked for a real estate agent. And I learned a lot doing that about um, real estate and, you know, with the process to, to buy and sell and things of that nature. And then, you know, coming over to this side of it and seeing the investment side of it and how that works and everything, it, it's really just changed my life. And so, you know, being able to lend out of my 401k has been awesome. And I couldn't do it without you guys because I attend the classes just like you do. And I have questions just like you do. So it's been great. What kind of interest rates are you seeing typically people are lending money at? It, it truly is all over the board. Um, and it, it does depend, you know, if, if I see something that is longer term, um, then I'm going to see a lower interest rate. I do feel like the interest rates have changed a little bit over the last two to three years. Um, but I'll just give you really, really loose kind of like ballpark numbers. Like I might see something here where it's typically 10, you know, and anywhere from nine to 10 or 11, 12% for something that would be considered short term. But then, you know, we have an office in the Atlanta area and I always hear them talk, you know, 12, 13, 15% when they're lending short term. So endpoints and all kinds of things. So it's really going to depend on the term. It depends on the market. It dep depends on the investment. So. And long term or what are they, five to 10? It's all over the place. I really, I, I don't want to say whether it's long or short because it, it really truly is all over the place. I'll say I probably maybe third, fourth person I was going to do a private money um, deal with. He was going to lend to me. I offered him what I was paying other people and come to find out it was so high that it scared him because to him, a high interest rate meant risk. So I have learned just to always ask people what they're looking for because I missed out on him lending me money because he just thought it equaled risk. Yeah, and, and you know, again, looking at the market, so <clears throat> some of the interest rates that I see in the Atlanta market down here that it, it seems really high, you know, but what they're seeing versus what we're seeing is just different. And, you know, some of the state laws are different too, you know, so usury in the state of Florida is different than it would be in the state of Georgia. So. That's interesting. Awesome. Okay. Can you, can, can you guys hear me? I don't know if you can oh, yeah. hear me. I'm back in the we meeting. Can. Oh, good. Okay. I'll, I'll mute myself, but I didn't know if I was back or not. I, I, we can hear you. Did okay, great. I think there was someone that was had a question there and I interrupted them. I'm sorry. I was going to ask if anyone else had a question before Larissa goes 
to her children for the evening. <laughs> Hopefully they're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so before Larissa goes and gets some relaxation time. That's right, that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, then, thank you again. Everyone give Larissa a very big PC thank you. And if you need anything, reach out to her. Thank we you. We will continue the meeting, but we're going to do the official ending here. So if you do want to leave and you need a, a reason to leave, uh, now's the time. So we thank you very much for being with us tonight. And we will see you at the next meeting. Thank you guys. Thank you everybody. Larissa, it was wonderful.